A few months ago, I got an email from the Sony repair shop saying that they were going to scrap my FS7 Mark II for parts if I didn't pay $5,000 to replace nearly all the camera's internal electronics that I'd ruin with my own sweat. I'll get into that in just a minute. The repair tech said even if I went ahead with the repairs, they couldn't actually guarantee it would ever work properly again. And a quick check on Facebook Marketplace showed me that I likely wouldn't be able to sell the camera for much more than the cost of the repairs. So I swallowed the lump in my throat and ignored the follow-up emails until one day they gave me a final warning. Pay the bill right now or we'll destroy the camera which I also ignored. I can only assume the camera no longer exists other than as a pile of cannibalized parts in a warehouse somewhere. But even though losing that money hurts big time, overall, I'm happy my camera got destroyed. That FS7 saw me through the most important five years of my career as I went from shooting small news stories to high budget documentaries for clients like Netflix, National Geographic, and a bunch of others. This camera literally paid my rent and put the food on the table for years. And if I hadn't made the irresponsible decisions that eventually ruined it, I'm not sure any of that would have happened, but I'll explain what I mean by that in just a second. In this video, I'm gonna talk about why I think abusing your gear might be the most important thing you do as a documentary filmmaker, and why I can only hope that all my cameras in the future meet with the same kind of untimely end. Then I'll go into a few quick tips on what you can do to prevent that destruction from happening for as long as possible, but in the end, I hope your gear gets destroyed too. And here's why. Hey guys, welcome back. And if you're new here, my name is Luke Forsyth. And on this channel, I teach the skills I've learned over 10 years working as a documentary filmmaker and photographer. If you're into that kind of thing, make sure to hit the subscribe button because I've got new videos coming out every week. Before I start, let me give you the basic story of my FS7, how it helped me launch my career and how I eventually killed it with my own sweat. It wasn't the first video camera I bought, nor was it the last, but it was the one that saw me through the most significant change in my professional life when I went from being a perpetually broke news videographer to a full-time documentary DP. If you've been following this channel for a while, you might know that before I got into documentary filmmaking, I was a photojournalist based in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, where I covered the Asia Pacific region for newspapers like the New York Times and worked for a bunch of international aid organizations like the United Nations and the Gates Foundation. Eventually, as the internet took over the media world, I started to realize that video was going to be an important skill to learn if I wanted to stay competitive as a visual journalist. So I got into the early days of HD SLRs. Once I had a few short projects under my belt, still mostly for news outlets and NGOs, I started to get more and more excited about the storytelling possibilities of video, and I thought I might actually like to try and make some short films. Now DSLRs had great image quality, but their audio options and battery life sucked. So eventually I invested in an FS7 Mark I and started to advertise myself more and more as a video shooter instead of a photographer. In the beginning, I kept working in the world of journalism, making shorts for people like the New York Times or the Washington Post, uh, Buzzfeed News, Vice. But then one day out of nowhere, I got a call to fill in as a B-cam shooter on a National Geographic show about heroin production in Mexico. It was the first time I'd been part of a real film crew working with a real budget and I fell in love with it right away. Within a year I'd reworked my website and reoriented all my social media profiles to focus on video instead of still photos. I built up my reel by shooting small independent projects around Mexico using the FS5 and I beefed up my skill set by working as a B-cam or a camera assistant on big international productions that came to Mexico. Then I made trips to New York every six months or so and booked meetings with as many production managers and directors as would answer my emails and eventually more and more work came in. After a year or so, I started to get the first requests to work as an ACAM shooter, often as a unit DP who would go out and film scenes in Mexico with a skeleton crew when it didn't make financial sense to fly in a whole team from another country. When I didn't mess those up too badly, I started getting hired as the director of photography and was brought onto projects from day one instead of just coming on as a part-time role player. The only problem was that the FS5, great little camera that it was, wasn't really beefy enough to be the A-cam on a multi-million dollar Netflix shoot. Most of these shows wanted an FS7 or an F55 or a C300, something with a better codec and higher bit rates. So every time I had a big job, I had to rent one. But eventually, the volume of work got to the point where I was renting an FS7 for weeks or, or even months at a time. And when I did the math, I realized I'd be better off owning one myself and renting it out. So I waited until a particularly big job came in a three month feature doc about a sports team on the US-Mexico border, and I bought a refurbished FS7 Mark II from B&H. 
By the end of that project, I was able to pay off the camera completely from the rental fees, and for the next three years or so, I used that camera on pretty much every job I did around the world. Now the FS7 wasn't a particularly sexy camera, it was a utilitarian tool. It wasn't small and innovative like the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema cameras, it didn't have Hollywood level image quality like the Aries, and it wasn't welcome on commercial sets like the RED cameras. It wasn't full frame, it had a menu system and user interface that drove me insane, and all the files were slightly green tinted and had to be tweaked in post. It was no one's dream camera necessarily, but it was an absolute workhorse, and it just kept on going no matter what I threw at it and I threw a lot at it. I used it in the rain, in dust storms, on boats, on the beach, inside caves, on top of mountains, hail, snow, deep in the jungle. If it was crazy wet, I'd drop a backpack rain cover over top of it. If it got especially dirty, I'd clean it off at the end of the day with a paintbrush and a rocket blower. But most of the time, I just kept using it, no matter what the conditions. And for the most part, it never complained. But then, in 2020, I went to Kenya to film a bat documentary for Vice. Because of the risk of disease and infections, we all had to wear these full body suits whenever we went into the caves, and those things were not at all breathable. Combine that with African heat and the humidity of a bat cave, and you can probably guess we were sweating a ton. What I didn't realize was that I was sweating so much as I was shooting, it was pooling in my sleeves, and whenever I'd take the camera off my shoulder and carry it by the top handle, the sweat was pouring out the cuffs and drenching the camera. Now, obviously water and cameras are ancient enemies, and now that I think about it, it's actually pretty surprising that it made it as long as it did. But after a full week of daily soakings, the weather ceiling finally gave out and the camera shut off. When I finally got back to Canada, I dried the camera out and took it to a local repair shop that said they cleaned up a bunch of internal corrosion, and for a while, the camera seemed like it worked. Then, one day, it lost power in the middle of an interview, and no matter what I tried, it just would not turn back on. I sent it back to the same repair shop, and they replaced a couple more components and charged me a bunch of extra money for it, but a month later, it shut off again. I realized that I couldn't really rely on it for professional work anymore, so I sent it to Sony for a full analysis and dug deep into my savings to buy a used FX9 which is the same A camera I currently have. Don't get me wrong, the FX9 is a great camera and I'm glad I have it, but I didn't really want to buy it. And if the FS7 still worked, I would have kept using that. Eventually I heard back from Sony and as I said, the quote for repairs was more or less the same as the camera was worth. Which brings us back full circle to where I started. Because I repeatedly ignored Sony's emails, I can only assume the camera is no more. With any luck, some of its components will go into another refurbished unit, which some young filmmaker can buy at a discount to shoot their first documentary like I did years ago. At first I was mad. I planned to sell the FS7 for at least a few thousand dollars to offset the cost of the FX9, and learning that it was pretty much a write-off was not the news I wanted to hear. But the more I thought about it, the more I understood that if I hadn't destroyed that camera, I wouldn't be where I am today. If I hadn't ignored the camera's safety in the name of using it to get the shots I needed, I might not have delivered the kind of shots that kept clients coming back for their next projects. If I hadn't used it in all those terrible conditions, the footage I sent back might not have been up to client expectations, and there's a very real chance I wouldn't have gotten a second call. Without mounting it to cars, or using it on dirt roads, or hanging it off the sides of moving boats, or any of the other stupid things I did with it, I might never have convinced directors and producers that I was the kind of shooter they wanted on their dock crew. I guess what I'm saying is that in the documentary world, cameras are meant to be used. It might be possible to keep things in pristine condition when you're working on a soundstage somewhere, but if you want to make a living filming the real world, you need to take your cameras into the real world. And the real world isn't a particularly clean or sterile place. In order to tell stories well, you're going to have to put your camera or lenses or a drone or whatever into all sorts of compromising positions, because I've never met a really good documentary DP who doesn't. Now even though I'm saying this, I know that for most people, myself included, despite what it may seem like, filmmaking gear is a huge investment and the thought of destroying it is terrifying. In fact, I know that for most people on the earth, the thought of being able to afford one of these cameras at all is way beyond their financial realities. And to even have this gear to risk in the first place is a very privileged position. I'm not saying that you shouldn't take care of your gear or that you should just break and buy new things without caring. What I'm saying is that you should view your camera gear as tools to be used, not trophies to keep on your shelf or safe inside a backpack. To succeed in this business, you need to get your gear out there and actually use it. 
That's how you're gonna get the best stories and the best shots, not back in your office where everything is protected. And part of the risk you take when you take cameras out into the world and all the crazy places in it is that it won't come back. So I wish that my FS7 still worked because I'd be quite a bit richer if that was the case. It sucks that it died and nothing will change that. When I think of all the amazing shots and crazy stories I was able to get because of the fact that I didn't baby it, I think I'd make the same decision again. Now with all that said, there are a couple things I found that you can do to give your gear the best chance of survival. The first is to get a rain cover. While heavy rain might shut down a controlled set, docks can't always sit around and wait for the rain to stop. Or sometimes the rain might even be an important part of your story and you have no choice but to get out in it. For a long time, I just used a backpack cover with an elastic trim around it and draped it over the top, and that sort of worked. Then finally I invested in a custom built rain cover, and if I could do it all over again, I'd probably have done that much sooner. Mine is from a company called Portabrace, and it's made to be about the same shape as my camera, with openings for the mic and monitor and top handle, uh, so you can keep using it when it's on. It's got clear plastic where the buttons and controls are so you know what you're doing, and an elastic band thing that cinches down around the lenses. Now it's definitely not perfect, and taking it on and off is excruciatingly slow. Uh, and it's absolutely much more annoying to use the camera with this thing on. But if you get it set up right, you can film in some pretty intense rain while keeping the camera totally dry. It's much more reliable and secure than my old backpack system, and if I'd used one of these in that bat cave, my camera would probably still work now. The next thing I'd say is to build up an AC pouch that has a multi-tool, a rocket blower, a paintbrush, and a toothbrush at minimum. I made a whole other video about everything that's in my AC kit, which I'll link to somewhere up here. But these four things are key in my opinion. Dust and sand are kryptonite for cameras and can jam up your buttons or lens rings if you're not careful. So the blower is for your first pass to get all the loose big chunks off there and to blast fine grains out of the cracks. Then the paintbrush is for the more stubborn dirt that the blower can't move. Finally, the toothbrush is for the little nooks and crannies that the paintbrush can't get into. If you can stay semi-disciplined and clean your camera off every night or two after the shoot, you'll decrease the chance that a random piece of sand stops your record button from pressing properly. Finally, if you're using a lot of audio gear in bad conditions, namely if you're worried that they're gonna get wet, try using a condom around your wireless labs. It might seem weird, but condoms are strong, flexible, and waterproof. And they're also form-fitting, so your wireless labs won't fall out. If you think your characters might get wet, put a condom around your audio gear before you stick it in their pocket. Some of those innuendos were pretty close to the edge, but anyways, let me know in the comments if you have any other hacks to keep your gear safe. So take care of your gear, value it, and do what you can to keep it safe. Get insurance for the most expensive stuff so you don't get wiped out overnight. Get a rain cover and build up some basic maintenance tools and give your stuff the best chance of surviving to the next shoot. But whatever you do, make sure you're using this stuff for what it's made for, which is telling amazing stories about the world and the people who live in it. And if that means your gear might get hurt in the process, that has to be worth the risk. All right, that's it for today's video. Hope you found it interesting or at least entertaining that it made you want to get your gear out of the office. If you liked it, maybe think about subscribing to the channel because I've got new videos coming out every Wednesday. Or maybe think about checking out this other video I made about the toughest piece of gear I've ever bought, my Sackler Flotec tripod. See ya!